Okay, welcome to A Lit Passage, Conversations in Reading and Living. Tonight I'm incredibly excited to be joined by Val Vinokur for a Dostoevsky Day celebration. Professor, poet, critic, editor, and translator, Val is an associate professor of literary studies at the wonderfully innovative Eugene Lang College of the Liberal Arts at the New School in New York City. He is the author of The Trace of Judaism, Dostoevsky, Babel, Mandelstam, and Levin Yah, and translator of Isaac Babel's stories, both published by Northwestern University Press. He is also the author of Relative Genitive, Poems with Translations from Asip Mandelstam and Vladimir Mayakovsky. I always think of the boot and the bid bug when I come across Mayakovsky, Val. And Val is the founding editor of Poets and Traders Press. And I love the illustrations on your uh, website for Poets and Traders Press. <laughs> Very timely, actually, right now. But uh, even, this, <laughs> yeah, even this doesn't capture the, the writing and translating uh, and his accomplishments. So we'll list a, a link below in description. But thank you again, Val, for taking some time out of your, your summer in New York City to celebrate Dostoevsky Day with me. I'm really, really, uh, I really feel privileged to have you for this time. Thanks for um, rousting me out of my torpor. <laughs> yeah, we all need that. Yeah. Um, so Sunday, July 5th, marks the 11th Dostoevsky uh, Day in St. Petersburg. Uh, Dostoevsky Museum in, in St. Petersburg has been a big force behind it. One of the, I think there's seven Dostoevsky Museums in Russia. And we have an impossible task. I mean, there's no way to cover what we, what we could cover in, in just this short time together, um, considering the scope and the works and the impact of Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky. Um, you could think about spending hours just on one work, uh, one character, even a few pages. And when you in, in add the translation aspect, uh, one word we could spend an hour on. But in the spirit of the end of Dostoevsky's masterpiece, The Brothers of Karamazov, uh, when Alyosha is gathered around the stone, uh, promising to remember Kolya. I don't want to give away the ending. Uh, but promising to remember Kolya in the hearts uh, in the hearts of the boys who are with them. So maybe in that spirit, in this um, keeping Dostoevsky's memory in our heart and sharing through stories, we are inspired by that scene. I just wanted to start with a little story because I noticed today that the Dostoevsky Museum on, on sa Saturday, I think, is doing this crazy tour. You know, there's 20 addresses that Dostoevsky lived in uh, or associated with his work as well. And they're going to do this virtual tour where they have a, a guide at each address on live Instagram by kind of giving tours so people all over the world can check in and out of the addresses. And I think it's really interesting because I, looking back at my time when I was leading this kind of lecture in the streets through Dostoevsky's Petersburg, I was always struck by, it wasn't necessarily the Dostoevsky places, the addresses he lived, that moved people, but it was the fictional addresses of the characters. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the house where Dostoevsky wrote Crime and Punishment was not nearly as exciting as the house down the street where Raskolnikov may have lived. There's a beautiful plaque there. But people were really enter uh, engaged and excited and enthusiastic when we were Entering spaces of the fictional world, uh, the pawnbroker's house uh, is another example, or Raskolnikov's staircase, or even one of them. There's possible staircases. So I guess what I'm getting at, Val, is what do you, what do you think it is that makes people want to almost continue to participate their dialogue in reading the fictional work, like, and somehow this pilgrimage to these uh, places. They're in that dialogue again, maybe in with the themes of the work, or maybe in their first reading encounter. Uh, what is it about Dostoevsky that you think generates that? Now, I remember running into a, a man in, from Peru on the Raskolnikov staircase, or one of them, and he was in his 60s, and he said, this is the only place I want to go. I wanted to go in my life when I left Peru. I had to visit this place. So I said, oh, how do you like St. Petersburg? And he said, no, no, this, this staircase. <laughs> so, what, staircase. Yeah. So I, I think that's rather unique. So I'm just really curious. Nice staircase. Yeah. So I'm really just curious about what is it in Dostoevsky that drives people to want to kind of almost participate again in their reading of the novels or 
in revisiting their themes. Again, if it's this kind of meditation, they re-enter the work in a way. Well, I mean, I, I, I could try to think about that question really in two parts. And the first part uh, isn't necessarily about Dostoevsky, but just the, about the phenomenon of literary pilgrimages in general. Right. right, because it's not just Dostoevsky. It's you know, sure. it's it's uh, it's Joyce. It's mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, you know, um, the world of Harry Potter. Yeah, where, you know, where I yeah. went to uh, with my family <laughs> yeah. several years ago. Right, uh, I mean, you know, and the the entire family was very excited about this stuff. You know, or whatever their connection to. Yeah. Harry what was Potter. it? Uh, King's uh, King's Crossing, nine and three quarters. Did you go to the trial? Yeah, yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, it, it, the, the whole the, the whole thing, you know. So, so, so the question is, um, I mean, it 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 seems that, uh, and, and and of course, but before secular literature, people did this with with scripture. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's what these pilgrimages are based on, right? You you, you go in the footsteps of Christ. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a there's a there's a kind of secular religion built around these fictional texts where they become um, uh, as real, or in some cases even more real than real life, right? So that's 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 a kind of a general phenomena that 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 one that one notices, right? That that drives uh, these sorts of tours, right? Uh, now, as as far as specifically Dostoevsky, I mean, I don't know. I think you're you're better placed to to uh, to answer that question as someone who used to give these tours, mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, I think that um, I think that because people who love Dostoevsky, they really love Dostoevsky, yeah. right? You, you can't really feel lukewarm about him. You either hate him. Right. And if you don't hate him, you probably love him. Yeah. Right. Um, so, and, uh, and I think that, the people who love him are the people who are shocked into recognition when they read him. Yeah. Right. I have this, my, my favorite story about that is, this was like my first or second year teaching at the new school. And I had this, uh, somewhat older student who, uh, who was doing his, uh, senior work with me. Uh, and, uh, he was older because, he, he, he had originally gone to like uh, um, um, uh, UCSD, right? Like the, or University of San Diego on a full baseball scholarship because hmm. his entire family uh, was in, had, had been in college and professional baseball, like his father, his uncles and the whole thing. He was, he was from a baseball family and, and without the beard, he still looked like that. Right. right. So he was on this baseball scholarship and then, and then he, and then he, uh, he had this. Um, uh, he basically destroyed his arm, right? Wow. Playing baseball, wow. and so he couldn't play baseball anymore, wow. and it completely just, just unbuilt him as a person. Wow. And he just went into this kind of internal spiral, like, who am I if I if I can't play baseball? You know. Wow. And that's what that's what he discovered Dostoevsky. Wow! Wow! The text, the text, uh, the texts come to us, my friend. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's what he discovered Dostoevsky, and then and 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 he and he just had this sort of revelation. Oh my God, Dostoevsky is right about 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 everything, right? And he would he would like he, he told me that he would tell, he told me the story. Oh, I one day I you know I uh, I walked into a Home Depot with my friend, and I and I felt just like the underground man. Yes. <laughs> like, what am I doing here? Who are these yeah. people? What is it? You know. <laughs> so so it was it was actually kind of somewhat frustrating to, for me to advise him in his senior work, which was about Notes from Underground, because he took all of it very seriously. Like, he, he didn't find the Underground Man to be in any way a ridiculous figure. He found nothing ironic or funny about it. Hmm. Uh, and, and I mean, like, from a certain point of view, he's, he's right, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but at the same time, it's it's a... I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of satire in that in that in that work, and mm -hmm. and he's a and, and he's a he, and he's a he's he and he himself knows that he's a, that he's a ridiculous figure, right? So he had a complete kind of tragic conception of what the underground man was because he completely identified <laughs> with that kind of consciousness, yeah. right? Because because he had once upon a time been one of the so-called you know ingenuous people, right? The gentleman. Uh, the, the, 
the, the gentleman, yeah, mm-hmm. the, the gentleman, the man born of born from nature's bosom, mm-hmm. right, for whom everything is natural, right? He yeah. was that guy, and yeah. then he couldn't be that guy anymore, and so yeah. he became the underground man, yeah. right? Even though he still looked like this kind of buff, you know, tall, blonde. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Dude, yeah. You know, so that that really kind of like, you know, that 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 really so so like someone like that, yeah, they would want to see Raskolnikov's staircase, yeah. right? Because because that that makes that makes that consciousness with which they identify, it makes it real. So it's not in Dostoevsky, the spaces are imbued with the consciousness of the characters. Like mm-hmm. they somehow reflect that. That's 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 yeah. how they dwell, right? Yeah. So I think that specifically for you know for Dostoevsky tourism, Dostoevsky pilgrimages, I would like to think that that's why people are doing them because it, it, it somehow it somehow makes those personalities with which they identify in various ways yeah. that much more real. Yeah. Yeah. When I think about about a thousand people who went on my uh, talk over the years, it's definitely this not not nostalgically relive their first encounter, but to continue that first encounter, you know, maybe yeah. almost uh, almost like the Deridian rereading. Um, mm-hmm. But being in that space helps bring new perspectives. Um, do you think, you know, mentioning Dostoevsky and students, do you think we uh, read Dostoevsky too soon? I'm thinking of the, the AP World Literature class that tackles Raskolnikov, maybe even some of the early uh, undergraduate students. Do you think we read them too soon? Because sometimes you encounter those stories of the encounter. And people can remember, I carried uh, notes from the underground forever for, for um, years after I read it, they say, or me personally, uh, I remember like shaking on the beach reading it because you're encountering this phenomenal voice, incredible character and a work that's still kind of ahead of its time. But other times you talk to people and it kind of gets high schoolified, uh, mm-hmm. like some, some other authors we encounter too soon. Yeah. Um... I don't know because I didn't I didn't read them in high school. Interesting. Um, I yeah, and, and and I think that was just largely an accident of the um, of the curriculum, which wasn't a bad curriculum, but sure. I guess it focused a lot on um, uh, it didn't we didn't do all that much stuff in translation. I'm I, you know I'm mm-hmm. trying to think uh, what we did. Um, in translation in high school, it, it wasn't it wasn't really that much stuff, um, so I didn't really fully get to him until college, mm. and I could definitely see how one could read him uh, uh, too soon. I had I had that experience of all things uh, reading. I read Catcher in the Rye too early, mm. uh, or maybe no. You could read something that, that like, you know, the, like Catcher in the Rye should be read either really early or really late, but not in between. So I kind of actually read him in between. I, I read him like, like, you know, either t- towards the end of high school, or beginning of college. And I just, I didn't connect to the voice at all. Mm-hmm. And I only recently reread Catcher in the Rye because my son was reading it wow. in ninth grade. <laughs> wow. and, I, and, and I just found myself crying. Right, and I'm like, right. what is going? On? And 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 I, and I had I had read other Salinger, you know, since then, but as but as far as but but you know, in terms of the intensity of voice, I think Dostoevsky's kind of a, would be a similar experience that mm-hmm. that it, it would have to be kind of properly timed. And uh, I would also say that that you know, like I said, I I read Dostoevsky in college, and then even more intensely in graduate school. Of course, yeah. And I feel like this, a lot of the same works, Brothers Karamazov in particular, just for me, ages like a fine wine. It just, it just yes. keeps getting better. Yes. Uh, so, so I connect to that book probably in a, in, a, in a better way now than I did when I was in grad school and when I first wrote about it and when I, even when I wrote my book on it. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I, I, I just get deeper and deeper into it. I don't necessarily have that with other Dostoevsky books. Like I don't, I don't have, I actually don't have like the same kind of connection with Crime and Punishment. Yeah. Uh, for whatever reason, I find it to be a more, a more primitive work. And maybe that is because I read that too early in college. 
Well, I definitely want to get get back to your uh, reading, uh, especially brothers over over kind of the years. But before we leave the students, when you when you're teaching your let's say the the undergrads uh, at uh, Eugene Lang, do you does Dostoevsky still speak to them? I was just reading uh, some diaries from the the blockade in Leningrad, <laughs> and one of the entries during the first year of the horrific siege. Uh, in 1941, over in the across to 1942, one of the diary entries was, you know, the, the people are starving. People, there's there's bombing. There's freezing, and uh, there's people dying all all over the streets, basically. And uh, this diary entry ended with red crime and punishment last night. <laughs> I just, you know, and I, there's other diary entries about Dostoevsky in some way inspiring them to save the city, uh, even from from uh, Navy, uh, uh, naval personnel who were there, but I'm just curious if, uh, as you're teaching it, if you've noticed a, a difference over your years of teaching, does it still connecting in a similar way? I mean, obviously the reading encounter is always different to the person, but is it still engage them in the way that maybe it did before when you taught? Uh, yeah, I would say so. And I'm, I don't really know why. I mean, in other words, I'm always I'm always like relieved and surprised. That's that another discussion. Oh, okay, this is this is still this is still a thing. Yeah. It's great. Thank God. I, I have I, I have a job for now. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I, I, I think I think I mean, I don't know. I, I think it has to do with with um, uh, with a lot of things. I mean, you know, you know, in, in, in college in particular, especially when I have students to have some students over four years, I, I, I witnessed them being just like emotionally, physically, and mentally transformed over those years. And so that, that kind of, the intensity of those transformations in such a short amount of time, I think, I think that fits well with the, with the kind of insularity, the intensity of, of uh, the way that Dostoevsky characters mm -hmm. think. Right. The other thing is that, um, you know, I taught uh, in fall of 2016, I taught um, uh, a seminar on the Brothers Karamazov. Right. It was, a, it was, a, it was like a like a, um, a deep dive. Uh, yeah. Um, a single text course. Yeah. Uh, but in that course, but I, but I decided and, and usually when I when I teach Brothers Karamazov, I also teach notes from underground at the beginning. This time I decided, oh, you know, you know, it'll be fun, uh, you know, during this election season. Uh, <laughs> let's teach No Sermon Underground and let's teach Demons. Yes. And then, and then uh, um, the Brothers Karamazov. So that was fun uh, <laughs> because, because everything that we were reading about in Demons and then later in the Brothers Karamazov yeah. somehow tracked with what was happening in yeah. the election. Yeah. And then once, and then once, you know, you know, once November 9th, whatever the hell it was, <laughs> happened, right? Um, and you know, everyone was just shell shocked. Right. It was easier and more productive to talk to talk about that through talking about the ending of. Uh, or we we were we were actually at the at the trial scene of the Brothers Karamazov, where everything wow. goes goes badly, wow. and it kind of. It was sort of perfect. Wow, like therapy. Uh, yeah. Um, so it was. It was. It was a really powerful experience. Um, so yeah, I guess I could imagine reading *Crime and Punishment* during the blockade. Um, I mean, it's not. You know, I guess the good thing about it is that it's not. Uh, it's not. There are no like descriptions of appetizing food <laughs> right. Right. right you know like nobody nobody really eats anything in in uh in uh in uh <laughs> Dostoevsky Dostoevsky novels. Novels. Yeah. they just they just drink tea and they, and they have like some 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 rolls or biscuits yeah uh, and once they, in a while and they talk a lot <laughs> and they talk a lot, right? you know the one thing the one thing is is you know uh yeah uh i think ivan karamazov is having fish soup I don't even know if he's having it. I think I think he just tells Alyosha that oh, they serve really good fish soup at yeah. the end when he has that when he has that long conversation with them. There's no you know there's no appetizing descriptions of food. Right. <laughs> um, so 
you know. <laughs> well, you'll you'll appreciate this. My last uh, year at when I was teaching uh, at the uh, Johnson Center in the University of Redlands, I taught demons and I call had a course called Demons and Brothers, and it was in a four week uh-huh. it was in a four week uh, a four week intensive block. So every day you we did, did both? it. Yeah, we did it in three hours oh a day. God. And what amazed me was the students, literally you had to read, we had three hours of class and then you had to read all night to be ready for the next day. And when I got to the end, and of course, you know, we, in some ways it wasn't the best in terms of getting the most out of each novel, but in some ways that experience of plowing through both of those uh, together in that short time period where you're not teaching anything else, you don't have any other classes. Uh, But Mm -hmm. I, I wanted, I was so impressed with the students' engagement with these texts that I, I, did, I said, you guys don't need a final. Don't worry about it. I have enough to evaluate you. But they made me give them a final. And so I was like, <laughs> okay, it has to be oral. And so, but it's incredible when talented students, but not, not maybe they just, some of them had just read for the first time. They weren't necessarily all going to PhD lit programs, but somehow it, it's these voices they encounter in, in such a unique way that pulls stuff out. I was thinking of your, work with Levinya about the intersubjectivity, Levin, intersubjective response, Levinas, yeah. Uh, Levinas. Levinas, yeah. In, intersubjective responsibility, you know, the call to, of action in a way. The, the text pulls people in in such fascinating ways. Um, but you, all, you also know this, I think, very intimately because you're, you're fluent in Russian, but it's fascinating that Dostoevsky is a world author. When you're outside of Russia, it's Dostoevsky. When you're inside of Russia, it, it Pushkin, Gogol, Tolstoy, even Turgenev maybe, and then and then Dostoevsky. So even friends that we have who are Russian, even Russian scholars, they're always somewhat amazed by the uh, foreign fascination with Dostoevsky. How somehow he reached this superstardom impact uh, where these others have it. Do you think that's a translation aspect that the translation can't capture the other works, or just something about? You know, his exploration of consciousness or ethical dilemmas. This, of course, is another hour we could talk about at least. But just, just curious, since we're celebrating World Dostoevsky Day. Well, there's no question that there's no question that um, translation can't capture Pushkin uh, or Pushkin's poetry in English. Mm-hmm. Uh, as for the others, I don't really see how they would be more difficult to, you know, like uh, Tolstoy, Chekhov, Turgenev. Uh, I don't see how they would be more difficult to translate uh, than um, uh, Dostoevsky. Uh, it's true that most Russians are are, are a bit annoyed with um, yes. with the world's obsession with Dostoevsky. <laughs> with you know, in particular, with the way like Americans are obsessed with Dostoevsky. Well, not just Americans. You know, the, the French are obsessed with Dostoevsky. Mm-hmm. With Italians, Dostoevsky, mm-hmm. you know, you know, Italians, you know, in, in a certain way. Uh, and I think they're a little bit annoyed with it because I, I guess the way that I've always seen it is that um, it's like, oh, you know, you you think you think all Russians are like are like Rasputin and uh, <laughs> Dostoevsky, yeah. uh, right? They, they 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 think that you know it's like it it, it kind of feeds into um, Western s- stereotypes of what Russians are, which is that they're as you know, Bidyaev the way he, the way he described. Um, of Russian culture and Dostoevsky is is you know either either um, either uh, uh, you know you know nihilism or apocalypse you know yeah. in other words you know heaven have, have, have or hell yeah. right um, uh, without without any kind of middle right mm. and that's and, and 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 the middle is something that you get in Turgenev in Tolstoy right. in Pushkin right in Dostoevsky you you kind of get these you know bipolar uh, uh, extremes, yeah. right? So, uh, of course, the 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 not so secret secret is that that reflects Russian culture pretty well. <laughs> uh, but it's you know it's not something that you'd like to be uh, you, you always like to openly acknowledge, especially when you have such beautiful stylists like right. Pushkin and Tolstoy yeah. and Turgenev and Chekhov who are who are somehow not as um, uh, intensely identified uh, with world literature, with 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 the literature that Russia has given to the world, as Dostoevsky is. Yeah. So they're so they're so they're so they're annoyed with that, I think. 
Uh, and also just on a, on, a, on a personal aesthetic level, yeah, I think most Russians like to read a, a, a beautiful text. Yes. Uh, and Dostoevsky is not beautiful in, in that conventional way. I mean, that's not what he's, that's not what he's, what he's, what he's trying to do, right? His, his style is sort of deliberately, um, you know, uh, awkward, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, he's not the one who is writing. It is, it is some kind of narrator who is not really him. Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I, I have, I have, I have found that to be really interesting. Um, that, um, for the most part, um, Russians in general, I mean, of course I also hang out with, with, you know, with Russians who happen to be, Dostoevsky scholars, so this is not an issue for them, right? You know, right. Uh, um, uh, also, it's interesting that, that I, I found that a lot of Russians who um, really go out of their way to identify as Russian Orthodox, this is more of a recent thing, yes. uh, will, will will say that they that they really like Dostoevsky. Interesting. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, but I but but I don't know if they mean it. You know, you know what I mean? Like I don't know if they're just doing that because well, he's he's identifiably. Russian Orthodox, whatever, whatever, whatever that means, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. or if they really, really like to read him, and, you, know, yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, don't, I don't, I don't know if they're just reading, you know, the uh, the uh, Slavophile and and um, anti-Semitic, uh, right, right, <laughs> you know, diary writer. Right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. But and that that's, I, that's, that's and that identification with that prophetic voice that kind of Dostoevsky found in the culture before, right before he passed in 1881. Right. Yeah, that kind of mantle just, he was holding up. He was holding this mantle, and and I, and I and I feel like that's that's often it's a it's it it's often misunderstood. I mean, I, I think he himself misunderstood it. Right? Yes. I think he was. It was. It's. It's funny that the expression is a mantle. I mean, it's literally a mantle. It's something that he, in yeah. a certain sense, something that he put on. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. Uh. Because he wanted to believe that. Right. As. Uh, you know my fa my favorite character in Demons, Shatov. Oh yes. Right? Who, yes. Who's, who's who is based on on Dostoevsky, right? When, yeah. when he's when he he goes on this whole like Slavophile rant about right. how Russians are the God bearing people and we'll save the world and yeah. and then Stavrogin asks him, oh that's that's really interesting, Shatov. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> uh, uh, so so Russians are God bearing people, but 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 you do 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 you believe in God? Right. And Shatov just says. I will believe. Yeah, I will believe. That's <laughs> I such, will believe. That's such a good book. We need to do just a talk on demons because when Shatov comes back to when the love of Shatov's life comes back, it's one of the most powerful oh, scenes, and she'll he'll take her back, and then of, of course how it unfolds. But yeah. um, and I, I also think there's something to do with the is Dostoevsky had these famous readers, so you know Lenin was not a fan. I think I think he didn't like. I think there's a quote where he said uh, he didn't like uh, Dostoevsky because he, he portrayed people as rats or something. But he didn't have a lot of fans in the, the Soviet time. But in the West, you know, Freud was reading him. You know, D.H. Lawrence was reading him. He got those yes, early translate, right. very early translations. The first notes from the underground I read was like a five cent copy paperback of um, the early translations. So it was almost like two Dostoevskys during the, the Soviet time. Uh, for a while, I think that may have may fuel into it as well. And there seems to be a, as you spoke, a, a there's definitely a religious renaissance, a rediscovery in, in Russia today, with that. I just saw an amazing uh, icon that was made for the royal family that was uh, murdered by the the Soviets. And now there's icons appearing in some of the churches. There's a lot of uh, um, new churches or re reconstructed churches. It's, it's pretty interesting. So I, I hadn't I thought know. about that before, but that connection to Dostoevsky is interesting. The last time that I was in Russia, uh, it, you know, I was out like deep in the countryside. I and mean, you, you see these billboards sprinkled around everywhere. And, it's, uh, and, it, was, uh, and it was an image of Tsar Nicholas II and uh, with, the, uh, with uh, you know, a text that said, Prestinas uh, Gesudar, which, which is... Forgive us, uh, wow. Uh, master. <laughs> wow, wow, yeah, wow. That's 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 amazing. That's amazing. I was thinking about one of the first dinners we had together in uh, during the SLS in uh, Saint Petersburg. Was uh, you dropped that uh, Charles uh, 
Clay, I believe, quote on George, George, George Clay. George Clay. George yeah. Clay. I'm yeah. sorry about that. Um, yeah. yeah, Dostoevsky is the most that can happen, and Tolstoy is what happens the most. Yes. So now, when we're as we're getting older, do you, that probably is, still applies in some way. But do mm-hmm. you think about that quote in the same way that you did when maybe we were younger? About I don't know. I, I what are, what did I think about it when I was younger? I, I don't I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's still it still definitely holds. It's a, it's a, it's a really great rule of thumb, and it's yes. and, but also to me it it it. it it suggests that they were after the same thing, but 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 from different ends. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is that they 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 wanted to understand what what consciousness was, right? And for Dostoevsky, consciousness was being sick of oneself, right? It's 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 that kind of doubling, right? You know, when mm-hmm. I I think, therefore, I am thinking about a self, and right. I mm-hmm. am in prison because of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why um, the underground man says that, uh, 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 right, having, you know, I, I'm, I'm, only, I'm, only, I'm only an extreme of, of, of what everyone else mm-hmm. suffers from. You, you, you just don't admit it to yourselves, right? right? Because, because any consciousness at all is a sickness, right? That's, that's basically what he says. Yeah. Like, that, that's why he's sick, is because he has consciousness. Uh, and the way that Tolstoy understood it is that, yes, we have consciousness, but what is consciousness? Consciousness is not this series of, 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 of extremes. Consciousness is already kind of benumbed by everything around it and by the fact that we have bodies and that we put things in our bodies like caffeine and, and alcohol <laughs> and we listen to music, which makes us feel things that we're not really feeling, Right. And uh, and here I am. I'm uh, uh, I'm dusting this lamp, and uh, then I move on to dust something else. And I can't remember if I've already dusted this lamp because because we're like machines because we're we're healthy and muscular and you know and and and, we're, and you know and uh, uh, and we have all of these urges and right and uh, uh, and this is what Tolstoy says about the Raskolnikov. He says, oh Raskolnikov, he didn't he didn't kill his landlady because. Uh, because he wanted to be Napoleon, it wasn't ideological. He, you know, he he uh, he, he he ate the wrong thing, and and uh, <laughs> you know he was worried about money, and you know it's just like he he you know, he yeah. should have just like done some breathing exercises, yeah. and it would have passed. You took know, took a walk on the literally. should have just took a walk along the canals and got some sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And, 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 and and of course and of course they're both right, right? Yes, because uh, because it is true that nobody in Dostoevsky is able to just like. Do some breathing exercise and take a walk on <laughs> the canal. Instead, like you know, like just when you think that Raskolnikov might do that, like no. Instead, he goes to a tavern and he overhears this conversation, right. which somehow convinces him that yes, he should go through with this. Yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, what the hell? But 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 that can happen too, right? Yes, you know, so yes. So really, both Tolstoy and Dostoevsky are 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 right about uh about the world as you know it, they're they're realists in that sense that that that. The reality of consciousness is both mm-hmm. the most that can happen and what happens the most, right? So they're they're, you know, um, and I think that they that there were moments in which they recognized that about each other. Yes, which yes. is also interesting. There, there's there's this great there's this great uh, story about um, uh, about this young woman who was um, in uh, in the in like the in the um, in the 1870s, uh, it was popular for people to sit in like a pressurized chamber in a kind of group therapy. And so she did this uh, with a group of people and she realized that one of them was Dostoevsky. Right? <laughs> so that's, that's, how she met, that's how she met Dostoevsky and they became friends. And then the punchline of the story is, and he would come over for tea every day. And that's how he read all of Anna Karenina to me. <laughs> that's her story that's great there's, <laughs> you know. there's another great story about uh, I think a father came to Dostoevsky asking for writing advice for his daughter and Dostoevsky started explaining the writer's life as he saw it you know the constant kind of like thinking and the agony and the engaging and you have people in yourself with all these characters in your head and these ideas and he was going on and stressing you know the agon or the struggle and right. then um 
uh, the, the, the father said something to the effect of, uh, I don't think that would be a good life for my daughter. And he talks about Dostoevsky looking completely baffled, <laughs> that, he, <laughs> that he couldn't understand why they would have that reaction. You know? <laughs> but uh, what's so great about that quote is it's a, it's a great way, it's a great lantern to take with you as you read into Dostoevsky. Because I was thinking about this scene in Notes from the Underground in part two, when he's one of the most unbearable scenes is him pacing back and forth during the dinner when uh, when uh, the other gentlemen are you know discussing yes. their their lives and futures and he's back and and at that moment that is the most that can happen to that character but it's just a dinner so having that uh, having that that that's such a great reading guide or a, a lantern tool into noticing some things very in a profound way I think in reading the text that's why I've always I've always appreciated that that quote yeah for you know for for these Dostoevsky characters everything everything is extra as, yeah. as the kids say yeah <laughs> <laughs> every everything is now I'm just really extra yeah yeah and uh everything is so immediate and you get this notion whether if someone's a, a character is about to commit suicide you get the notion that he could either do it or experience revelation and uh, mm -hmm. an epiphany that changes his life. And you always feel like there's this thing between, uh, you get almost this, this energy that either of those possibilities can happen at any moment. Even in some of the scenes that you reread where you know, you know what's coming, you still have this intensity of the now, of the moment. Um, and maybe it's tied to maybe his religious notion of grace, but uh, uh, I was- well, he's he he's interested in that moment of being on on the on the on the fulcrum, right? right? Which is why it's 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 interesting that you mentioned the scene from you know, it's from Underground where he's pacing, mm -hmm. right? And that's what pacing is, right? It's mm -hmm. like you know, you know, yes. uh, you know, do I stay or do I go now, right? Yes. Um, uh, and there's a great scene in um, well. I guess just giving it away, right? Right, but 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 uh, uh, in the brothers Karamazov, when Smirnyakov mm -hmm. finally tells Ivan mm -hmm. uh, what happened, right, right, what, what right. really happened, right, there's Ivan gets up and he tries to pace around the room, yeah, but there's no but there's no room for him to pace between like the <laughs> you know like between the chair and the wall or whatever, and he's just like. Yeah. And, and he's and he's and he's really annoyed that he can't pace. And he just sits, sits back down, right? It's and it's and it's kind of a comical scene, yeah. right? And then, right after that, when 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 he when 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 Ivan goes home and he and he sees his devil, mm -hmm. right? That's when Ivan starts to pace around. So yeah. he's able to pace around in that in that nether zone of. Consciousness when 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 he can't do it as Smirnyakov like in in reality yeah. he's able to do it you know with the devil in the room basically yeah right yeah. so the the pacing is 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 kind of a perfect sort of um, uh, I don't know what that's called is that like you know kinetic somatic um, mm -hmm. uh, you know metaphor for what for what happens in the Dostoevsky novel yeah yeah the uh... <laughs> Just think, whenever you bring up Ivan, I think of the great, the great comedic line when uh, Ivan tells his great an grand inquisitor story to Alyosha, <laughs> and Alyosha kisses him at the end, and he yells, "Literary theft!" <laughs> Literary theft. <laughs> plagiarism. Yeah, pl yeah plagiarism. Yeah. But right. I was, I know we're we're getting on in time, so I was curious about. We brought it up earlier about rereading Brothers Karamazov. So I was wondering how you're. Do you notice things differently now? Do, do certain things come into the focus now as an older reader or rereader um, that maybe you appreciate in a different way before, whether it's form or theme or language or do kind of things move in into focus in a way differently now as you read from an older perspective, more experienced perspective. Well, okay. So, I mean, on, on the, on the one hand there, you know, uh, the more you spend time with a text, the more s stuff you see in it, you know, little things and connections that you're able, they are able to make and on, on, on the, on the kind of micro level. And, 
you know, I don't really know how to talk about that because that's 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 all in my notes, and I and I can't retain any of that, right? <laughs> right? But I would say that on a macro level, the most striking thing for me has been, and this has been something that's become part of my teaching over the years, is I connect to um, a lot of the. Uh, a lot of the really sentimental passages, the so-called sentimental passages in the Brothers of Karamazov, like when um, Captain Snigiryov is telling Alyosha about uh, about his uh, about his son, right? You know about how about how his son got sick and you know yeah. all of that. Yeah. Um, uh, and also um, uh, one of the one of the one of the peasant women who comes to see Zosima early in the novel and talks about her her dead son, Alexei, mm -hmm. right? So, so for example, those are two passages that I end up reading out loud in class, and I, no matter how many times over the years I read them out loud in class, I am always crying as I'm reading them, and half of my students are also crying as I'm reading them. Wow. So, to me, the emotional impact of that book just keeps, and, and I don't remember having that kind of reaction when I was full on working on Brothers Karamazov mm. uh, as a graduate student and then, and then writing my dissertation, which became my book, right? I, I don't remember that having that kind of visceral connection. Maybe it's because now I have, you know, I have, I have, I have, I have a kid, um, mm. uh, you know, and, you know, and also, you know, and just other things that have, that have, that have, that have happened in my, you know, in, in, in my life, but that emotional connection really deepens. And what's interesting is that I can convey it just in the act of reading to my students. So uh -huh. it seems like a very simple thing. Um, and it's not particularly intellectual, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But that's a, for me, that's a very important uh, discovery. And it's a very important moment in, in just in terms of literary and moral education, mm -hmm. not only for my students, but, but, but for me as, 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 a, as an ongoing thing. Yeah. So that's that's what that that's what really strikes me is that that that's that that kind of emotional impact from those sorts of passages mm. and the way that that really informs the entire novel, which, as you say, is otherwise, you know, it's 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 filled with all this humor and, you know, and you have, you know, if Fyodor was just absolutely depraved in the yeah, scene. Just and, takes you know, over the book. Yeah. Just takes over the book, right? So, so, so you know, you you so you have that, but at the same time, you also have those passages, in, including you know, uh, Captain Snigiryov is also mm -hmm. a, a very problematic character, right? And and a, and a and a and a deeply ridiculous character, but it's but it's the it's the tears through the ridiculousness of it that are that that's just so hmm. that's just so incredible. I haven't encountered yeah. anything like that so far in another author. Yeah, well, you had mentioned about how the text. Uh, Kind of teaching you to read it, uh, the more you approach it. And I'm curious, uh, especially with someone you in your doctorate and your your published book on Dostoevsky, um, has Dostoevsky shaped your reading of other texts? Have you learned about yourself as a reader, or even as a, a person in a way that you would attribute to your long dialogue with reading these books? Well, I mean, it's true that I'm constantly making, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly seeing Dostoevsky in other things that I'm reading, mm -hmm. right? Uh, even if they're not there explicitly, but sometimes they are explicit. I mean, you also, this actually speaks to the, to, you know, to the role of Dostoevsky in world literature, you know, for, for, for writers like Salinger, I mean, they're, they're basically, Dostoevsky is, is, is in the matrix, is, is in the loam. Sometimes really quite explicitly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it, all, all of that is there, and that becomes that becomes kind of visible. So, I, you know, I I try to restrain myself from constantly making uh, connections to Dostoevsky, but I but I fail to restrain myself. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess the other thing, just just for me personally, I uh, I have you know over the years been discovering the ways in which even though I um, have basically been an American since the age of seven, how uh, 
uh, how emotionally Russian I am or can be, right, in ways that are Dostoevsky. And so these are the things that I've been kind of forced to, I've been forced to ad ad admit about myself, even if it's something that you, you want to be able to control, because otherwise you're just kind of repressing that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's also, you know, to, 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 to a certain sense, to, to, to see myself in, in the way that Dostoevsky characters react, right? Wow. Uh, the way that they don't have this 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 um, emotional or cultural middle ground, right. right? This is what Mikhail Epstein writes about. Right. Uh, did, did, you know, did as well. Shostov. Hmm. Uh, this is like a classic trope of Russian, hmm. uh, you know, culturology, if you will. Right. Hmm. Uh, so yeah. So on a personal level, it's, it's it's been interesting for me to see how you know how 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 that how that's me, you know, uh, wow. in a way that I. I think spent years sort of, you know, <laughs> not acknowledging us. Right. That's, right. that's, yeah. real, that's yeah. really fascinating. That's another hour conversation at least. Sure. <laughs> so what, and I know, uh, you know, uh, I know uh, you have a, a dog you have to take out soon, so uh, we'll let you go in, in just a few minutes. But before we do, I just, I was curious about what are... By the way, my, 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 my dog is, 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 he's a year and a half old uh, golden retriever named Toby. Nice. And uh, and uh, he he has the personality of Al Alyosha Karamazov. Oh, that's beautiful. That's I, I've beautiful. Been, I've been, I've, 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 on, on my Facebook once in a while, I I, I I I often take him out during the twilight through the park, and and the slanting rays of the sun yes. hit him, you know, as they, as they, as they do, yeah. right? You know, yeah. as just yeah. like Alyosha describes, and I'll yep. always post yep. I'll post a picture of that of him yep. on, on Facebook. With some quote from the homilies of Father Zosima, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and that and that uh, that image, you know, all, all we need is a few images that are memories that will sustain us. Uh, That's it's right. amazing, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But but Val, what what if anything are are we missing or we overlook or needs to be recovered as people as we move further into God? I mean, Dostoevsky about almost 150 years ago he passed away, but Maybe there's nothing. Maybe now it's this flurry of scholarship and, and reading uh, and sharing about explorations into Dostoevsky. But do you think there's something that's getting overlooked that we need to pay more attention to, either you know, in his offering? I mean, I, don't, I mean, there's it's it's such a big industry, uh, you know, in terms of the scholarship on Dostoevsky, and there's so much there's so much interesting and diverse stuff. I mean, for me personally, it's not just, it, it's not a matter of what gets overlooked, but I, I do feel like there is still a bit of a dichotomy among the sort of the, 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 the main Dostoevsky scholars, and I think this applies for, to the readers as well, where they either see Dostoevsky as, um, as some kind of orthodox zealot, or they see him just as a pure kind of almost atheist existentialist, right? And I guess you could almost argue that it's that it's sort of like the, uh, you know, maybe the difference between, a, you know, a French Dostoevsky and, <laughs> and, 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 and an Anglophone Dostoevsky maybe, but that's, 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 that's way too crude. Yeah. But I don't think either of those things are true. Yeah. Uh, you know, because the, the, they're all, they're, you know, they're all, they're all different, they're all different mantles or voices that he puts on because they're, mm -hmm. he, he, he takes in all of these different kinds of consciousnesses, right? Yes. And like Shata, he wants to believe, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and so, so he's, the, the, there's, there's a kind of aspirational yeah. logic to, to, to his faith or, or whatever it is, right? I mean, the, 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 most, the most famous line, and I think the, the most misunderstood one, is the one that appears in his letters to Madame von Wiesena, mm -hmm. right? Um, when he thanks her, you know, she, she's one of these uh, December's wives, mm -hmm. right, who mm -hmm. kind of became a missionary and, and, who, mm -hmm. and who helped Dostoevsky and other prisoners as they were going to, as is they were she, going to Siberia. Is she the one who gave him the Bible that he was she's holding the one who gave him the Bible. when he was, that he was right. holding when uh, Anna was reading to him on his deathbed from that Bible, I believe? Yes. Yeah. 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 She's the one who gave him the Bible. So, so, yeah. so, so, so he wrote this very famous letter to her. Um, can't remember, maybe in the 18, 1860s, maybe 1850s, 1860s. Um, you know, it was, it was it was it was after he returned, uh, 
where he says, um, if someone were to prove to me, like mathematically beyond a shadow of a doubt, mm -hmm. that truth is over here and Christ is over here, mm -hmm. I would, I would, notwithstanding, I would choose to be with Christ, mm -hmm. right? And everybody says, "Oh, you see what a what a you know what a uh, you know either oh you see what a what a, what a great man of faith he was or oh you see what a what a what a what a what a crazy zealot he was right mm -hmm. but if you think about that quote <laughs> <laughs> more profoundly what is he really saying <laughs> right he's saying that Christ can and probably is the opposite of the mathematical actual right. truth. Right. Right. So it becomes an act of, 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 of utter perversity, right, to say I'm going to be on the side of untruth. <laughs> right. So what is what is he really saying there? He's not he's not making you know, he, he's there's it's a it's a it's a much more complex right. statement yeah. than it's than it's usually taken out to be. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. just sort of one. That's 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 one. That's one interesting, you know, example. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so this idea that oh he was a he was a radical or oh he was a you know he was a he was a uh, fundamentalist a fundamentalist right <laughs> yeah right it's like well yes yes <laughs> yeah and no. so yes and right. no yeah yeah and uh, similarly are there things that either we should be more critical of in our rereading I'm thinking you had mentioned uh, especially in his nonfiction about a lot of the work that's being done with. Uh, his exploration of anti-Semitism. Uh, are there things that we, are there, I mean, I, I guess are critic, <laughs> critically more important now yeah. that are being un unearthed, I guess, with all of the, the scholarship. I mean, the scholarship about his, is about his anti-Semitism has been around for a while. And I've, and I've, and I've, uh, and my work, uh, to a certain extent contributes to it. Right. Mm. And he, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't. He wasn't exploring anti-Semitism. You know, he was. Yeah. He was. He was. Yeah. He was fully engaged uh, uh, right. in uh, in um, in um, anti-Semitism. Um, there are, you know, there there are places where I talk about. I, I mean, fundamentally, the way that I understand is anti-Semitism is. Um, he. The way that I understand him is that he's a, he's a he's a guilty philo semite. Mm. Uh, in other words, that there's something weirdly Jewish about um, the kinds of um, neurosis that you see in Dostoevsky novels, mm. right? Um, and there's the extent to which he 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 involuntarily identified himself. With Jews, and therefore he had to be anti-Semitic. <laughs> that's that's sort of how that's sort of how it operates. Because the ways in which that he condemns Jews in Diary of a Writer, you know, in which he says, mm -hmm. "Oh, everywhere the Jews are shouting," right? Um, and it's like you're shouting, right? right. <laughs> so many of his just, characters are shouting. Yeah, it, you're 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 shouting. It's 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 like I I think you know I think he's just he feels at a disadvantage because in his view. Uh, the Jews have been effectively modern with all of that entails, with all the split consciousness that, that entails for like a, a couple thousand years in his mind. And the Russians have come to it really, really, really late. Hmm. Hmm. Right. And so he believes that, oh, you know, here are the Jews in this situation of Russia's belated modernity. And there's no way we can compete with that. <laughs> there's no, or, there, or, or, or maybe he felt that there's no way that even he could, you know, compete with that. So I think that a lot of it, a lot of it comes from, you know, from from that. Also from the fact that, you know, the Jews gave us the Bible, right? Uh, you know, so there's, so there's 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 that kind of supersessionist anxiety there as well. But there's all sorts of other stuff. You know, he I think he, he associates Jews with 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 the body and with the frailty of the body. Hmm. And of course, that's something that he associated himself with, and a lot of right. his characters, right? right? You know, this is this is uh, you know, Carol Emerson has talked a lot about how you know Tolstoy's preeminent critic is Shlosky, uh, who was this like Tolstoy was this kind of vigorous, healthy guy, you know, war veteran, whatever. And 
Dostoevsky's premier critic was Bakhtin, who was sickly, right. uh, you know, like completely just sort of dissociated from his from his body, he was in a wheelchair. Uh, as uh, you know, Dostoevsky wasn't in a wheelchair, but Dostoevsky had epilepsy, and yes, that's uh, right. That's so interesting. London. So, so, so you know, Dostoevsky writes from the perspective of someone who's there's no way that you can be numb to what your body's doing as you can be in. In Tolstoy, you're you're not a vigorous person yeah. in Dostoevsky. Now you're just your consciousness. Wow. You know, just your you're just your mind, right? And what does that remind one of in the kind of stereotypical way, right? Jews, right? Mm. So so uh, you know, it, it's it's it's. I, I, I think that for for Dostoevsky, that's that's a lot of what of of what of what was involved. Um, you know, so and, and, and uh, you know, and and as like I said, I and other people have, have written about that in, in yeah. various in various ways. But it's not something that you can ignore. At least, at least the diary of a writer. There, there isn't, there isn't a whole lot of. Um, I mean, there's, a, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's one or two anti-Semitic moments in his, uh, in his, in his novels, but it's mostly in his nonfiction. Yes. Right. Which is also interesting. Very interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I was when I read uh, *Summer in Baden-Baden* by the the Soviet Jewish writer uh, Leonid Sip. Sipkin, I believe, um, yeah. who spent 20 years writing it. I think he was a doctor or a surgeon, and he spent 20 years working on this. And when I read it, I mean, that, that fundamental uh, aspect that he was wrestling with is, is that sensitivity of his eye to suffering and understanding yeah. suffering, but that, and, and that master fiction storyteller in a unique way to the Dostoevsky he encountered in the nonfiction works that you're talking about. And that's an that's an amazing book, which yeah. it didn't come out as a full book, I think, until after he had passed. But in true Dostoevsky and fashion, you're disappearing into into the darkness. So we're going to have to end <laughs> soon. But I think it's good for dramatic yeah. effect. The last question, right. the last question I have, I, 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 maybe we could talk about it later. But uh, I was curious about because you're a, a, a great translator, you're fluent in Russian. I'm just curious about this sick, wicked. Uh, aspect of Notes from the Underground, which uh, when uh, the translation came out by the, the prize-winning translators, Pavir and Volokovsky, uh, they, yeah. they, uh, they had translated uh, the beginning of Notes from the Underground with Wicked, and I recently read a translation from 2012, and it was back to, back to sick, or spiteful, I'm sorry, it was now spiteful. So I don't yeah. know Russian, obviously, as well as you do, so I'm just curious if you were wanted to weigh in on that. So the word in Russian is zloy. Uh, which is a very, very, very common Russian word. You can use it to describe uh, Zlaya Sabaka, which means like a, a mean dog. Mm. Right? It doesn't mean a wicked dog or an evil dog or a spiteful dog or wow. a depraved dog. Right? It just means wow. not nice. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, or, you, or you could say to someone, you know, that, that, was, that, was, that was very mean. Like you, you, you could so, but it also happens to mean evil and wicked and all that other stuff. So, so wow. it you know it partly it depends it depends on context. Uh, but you know the uh, the underground man uses the same word because it's the same word in Russian, right? Uh, so what do you do? Um, I I don't know. I I I at, at the beginning of this quarantine, I I started uh, just just for the hell of it. Uh, I started trying to retranslate the beginning of Notes from Underground, mm -hmm. and this is like I'm trying to. You look fine. How did I do it? Yeah, I said that I'm a, I'm a sick man, a mean man. I'm an unattractive person. Mm -hmm. I think there's something wrong with my liver. By the way, I can't figure out a damn thing about my illness and probably don't know what's wrong with me. I'm not being treated and have never been treated for anything, though I respect doctors and medicine. I would add that I'm also superstitious to the extreme, well, at least enough to respect medicine. I'm educated enough not to be superstitious, but I'm superstitious anyway. No, I refuse to be treated out of spite. So there I translate the word, you know, zloa, or zloist, I think, as spite. Because it would be weird to then say, out of meanness. Right, wow. Right? So, you know, so I, so, and I kind of, I'm trying to see how else I, uh, uh, how else I did. Yeah. So uh, uh, elsewhere he says, I, you know, like I was, I was a, I was a wicked official is how other people translate it. Hmm. And I said, I was a mean bureaucrat. 
Because wow. that seems more idiomatic. But I don't know if I'm right. Right. But, but of course. The, but the problem. But the problem is that it's a very simple word. Yeah. It, you know, we don't do. How often do we use the word wicked or evil? Like not, not much. Mm -hmm. It's the word mean. Mean. We use that word all the time. It's, you know, so don't be. You know, don't be mean to me, or you become mean. Right. We don't say you become wicked or you become evil. Right. Um, but it's the same word. So anyway. And so what does the word mean mean? <laughs> <laughs> we'll end it with there. Val, thank you so much for you. spending time with me. Uh, is there is there any uh, anything you'd recommend that people could you know keep up with your work or um, stay in touch with you? And we'll put it in the description uh, below as well. Stay in touch with me. You know, my name is eminently Googleable. There are no other Val than a so I'm uh, I'm I'm easily I'm easily found. Mm -hmm. If you just uh, if you just spell my name correctly, which yeah, is, well, we'll we'll make sure we do that. In no the, guarantee. Yeah, we'll yeah. make sure we we'll make sure there's no translation problem uh, yeah. controversy with that. We'll yeah. we'll put but it in I, the description. But, but the, the the latest thing I've been doing is I've I've had these weekly installments of this long pandemic poem that I've been that I've been uh, wow. that I've been publishing, which is I don't know why I it, it, I mean it, it's sort of like a like a wasteland for summer 2020, but it's also kind of Dostoevsky in certain ways. Wow. So and check that out. It's on, it's on, it's on, uh, it's on public seminar. And the, the name of the long poem is called the big cats. The, okay. Great. Great. We'll make sure we get that. I'd love to put that in. So thank you so much. I know your uh, beautiful Alyosha like dog is, is probably yeah. uh, ready it's to go. Right here. They know He's the right there. <laughs> <laughs> He's waiting. Wow. Gorgeous. <laughs> gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he's, he's pretty pretty well behaved for a year and a half. I thought it, I thought I would see his nose in the frame before now, like uh, being you a little more. It. Oh, I did. Looked away. He 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 gave me a little smooch, but he's he's he's, he's very good in the house. Yeah, that's he's great. very good in the house. I, I, you know, outside if there's garbage or picnics, that's a whole other matter. But in the in the house, he's he's very good. Yeah, he's very good. Well, <laughs> and, and thank you so much. I, I hope we can do this uh, again sometime, and maybe. Uh, uh, dig a little deeper in, in some one thing as opposed to going all over the place. But I, for me personally, I've always wanted to do a, a Dostoevsky Day celebration. And thank you so much for, for you. sharing your, your time and your, your expertise. And, and your projects sound all really uh, exciting and energizing to me. And I, I want to go work on my Russian, for sure. <laughs> so thank you so much, Val. You know what to do. All right. Take care.